started reading and when he reached the verse innani ana allah where allah says i am allah he said take me to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as soon as he said his shahada jibril came as well ya rasulullah are you happy at the islam of umar the prophet said yes i am very happy uh, jibril said ya rasulullah all the angels are happy as well but when umar radhiyallahu ta'ala no wanted to make hijra he came to the kaaba and made a tawaf calmly and then addressed the kuffar he says i'm leaving to go to to medina and if anybody wants his mother to cry over him his wife to be a widow his children to be orphan come and meet me outside hazrat umar gave his daughter to the prophet as hafsa the prophet gave his daughter fatima to hazrat ali hazrat ali radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu then gave his daughter Umm Kulthum to Hazrat Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu Allah has put haq the truth on the tongue and heart of Umar In the aqeedah of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah the most honorable people from the whole of humanity are the prophets and after the prophets the most honorable honorable people are the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah specially chose them to be in the company of the beloved prophet of Allah and from the companions uh, there are different levels as well uh, the people of who became muslims before conquest of Mecca are better than those who became muslim afterwards and from those the people who give allegiance to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at Hudaybiyah they are better than the rest and from them those particularly who participated in the battle of badr they are even more special about whom the prophet said la allahu ittala ala ahli badr fa qal i'malu ma shi'tum qad ghafartu lakum allah looked at them and said you do what you please i have forgiven all your sins uh, not that they ever uh, abused this trust of allah and this this uh, this good news and assurance given to them by rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and from them ashra mubashara a special and from them uh, particularly the four khulafa rashidun and after abu bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu azat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu is regarded as the best man in this ummah to the extent the prophet said if there was to be another prophet after me it would have been umar law kana ba'di nabiyyan la kana umar ibn al-khattab he is amongst those who was who were destined and uh, to be close to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and who were destined to be special from the beginning uh, from the beginning uh, so much so allah just as allah talked about his beloved prophet in the previous scriptures so did allah mention uh, the examples of the prophet's companions especially people like hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu once uh, there was a sahabi as kaab ahbar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he came to hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and he said umar I have seen from the previous scriptures that you are going to die as a shaheed. When the Muslims uh, turned their attention to Jerusalem after various different conquests and the Muslims laid a siege around Jerusalem and the people they came out the scholars of the Jews and the Christians and they said you will not be able to conquer us like this. Uh, in our scriptures we see the description of your amir if he comes to us we will give him the keys of the city without any battle sure. and umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu when he came and the jewish scholars when they saw umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu they offered themselves and they surrendered without any battle uh, so umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was one of those blessed souls destined to be special right from the beginning in fact in one hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has reported who have said ana wa abu bakr wa umar khuliqna min turbatin wahida that me abu bakr and umar we have been created from the same turba now turba how do you translate it in english if you say sand sand is something different <laughs> if you say clay clay is something different uh, but turba <laughs> urdu mein kehte hain matti uh, we have been created from the same mixture or from the same piece of sand or the same piece of dust or the same piece of clay uh, and it is reported in another hadith when a child is conceived uh, Uh, then an allah sends an angel who mixes uh, some of the portion of where a person is going to be buried into his into his fetus 
Uh, so it is destined where a person is going to die and be buried. So when as the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr and Omar radiallahu ta'ala when, bo- when they all died and were buried in the same place, so it shows uh, the nature of the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr and Omar radiallahu ta'ala was the same. Uh, Allah destined Hazrat Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma to be close and special with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in time to become uh, the true worthy successes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah chose his beloved Prophet to be from Quraysh and Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar were both from Quraysh as well. Uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was from the Banu Hashim family of Quraysh. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was from the Banu Taim. And Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was from the Banu Adi. And they were all branches of Quraysh. And they all eventually meet up uh, to the same ancestors, uh, to Fahr uh, and so on. And eventually, uh, and, and they are all part of the Quraysh. When Allah blessed his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the Nubuvat, and obviously people like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and uh, Usman bin Affan, Talha Saad bin Abu Waqas, and the Zubair, and such people initially became Muslim. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was held back. And he is the 40th person who is reported to have uh, accepted Islam. And in the beginning, who, when the Prophet ﷺ was preaching, and whosoever became a Muslim, with the exception of a few, like as Abu Bakr, ta'ala, anu, most people kept their Islam secret. And the, on the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. But when Umar ta'ala, anu, became a Muslim, not only did he announce his Islam openly, but also he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, let us now start praying openly. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, who is also a famous companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about whom it is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, as a Huzayfa radiallahu ta'ala who was asked about who is the man who resembles the Prophet most in conduct, in affairs and in dealings. And Hazrat Huzayfa said, Ibn Ummu Abdin. And this is the kunniyat of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Sahaba regarded Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be amongst, amongst the most amongst the most learned amongst the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to say uh, that Islam of Hazrat Umar was, is, uh, was Islam's victory. And his migration was assistance for the, for the Muslims and his khilafat was mercy for the Muslims. Uh, his coming into Islam was Islam's victory and his, his hijrat, uh, it was nusrat for Muslims and his khilafat was mercy for the Muslims. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala was one such person, nobody, before Islam, nobody could give him da'wah. And even before Islam, he was considered to be of, a high, of, uh, of high intelligence and good status in, in, in the Meccan community from the Banu Adi. He was a nephew of Abu Jahl, uh, Amr bin Hisham. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he compared him. Uh, in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's eyes, he was of the same status as Amr bin Hisham or Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl was one of the leaders of the Quraysh. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, before Islam as well was of a renowned personality. His father Khattab uh, is mentioned to have been a man of, uh, of thorough knowledge of Ansab. Ansab means uh, genealogy, uh, study of, pe- of people's ancestors and so on. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, similarly acquired that knowledge from his father. And he was a very eloquent orator, speaker and, is, and, uh, and renowned for his, his fearless bravery as well. And as such nobody could give him dawah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself prayed to Allah, especially, Ya Allah, Allahumma izz al-Islam bi Abi Jahl bin Hisham wa Umar bin Khattab. And the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accepted the Prophet's dua, which means, Oh Allah, help Islam, honor Islam. Honor Islam with either Amr bin Hisham, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was his kunniyat. Uh, in fact, this was a kunniyat given to him by, by, the, you know, by the Muslims. In fact, before Islam, he was known as Abu al-Hikam the father of wisdom and but it was his stubbornness and uh, his uh, his arrogance which then changed him to into abu jahl and uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed ya allah whosoever is dear to you from amr bin hisham and umar bin khattab give islam honor with them 
and Allah accepted the Prophet's dua in, the, in favor of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And, Umar, and the people of Quraysh were one day sitting in the vicinity of the Kaaba and wishing and commenting on how things had, uh, had turned around and, and problems had arisen in Mecca if only there was someone who would, uh, who would end the whole issue by, by coming forward and being brave enough to assassinate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, not that it was ever going to be possible because Allah has ordained, Allah has written upon Himself. Allah has stated in the Quran, I will always be dominant and so will, by, so will be my messengers. And with regards to the Prophet, Allah had given the Prophet assurance, Wallahu ya'simuka minan nas. Allah will protect you from people. Nobody will be able to harm the Prophet as such, especially especially to kill him or hurt him in that manner. So the Prophet ﷺ had no fear of anybody and, was able, and would go and preach in situations where ordinary people could not even dare. And uh, some people they say, Aisha and Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anhuma na'udhu billah along with Abu Bakr and Umar and they conspired to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hasha wa kalla how is that possible when people who wanted to kill the Prophet openly were never able to do so. As Aisha and as Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anhuma are the mothers of the believers, daughters of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and dear wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could they possibly ever imagine to do anything of that nature? And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah accepted, uh, I was saying, they were sitting, Abu Jal and company, in the vicinity of the Haram and wishing if there was anybody who could go and kill the Prophet. Umar ta'ala, this is before Islam, he stood up and he said, you people are good for nothing, you can only talk, I will go and do the job. So he took out his sword and started marching towards the house of the Prophet wasallam. He met someone on the way, some people have said it was Saad ibn Abi Waqas ta'ala, and seeing Umar in that rage and in that haste, with his sword uh, swinging in the air and in that state he asked him, Umar, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the job. And everybody was aware what job implies, killing the Prophet wasallam. And Saad radiallahu ta'ala replied, oh, Umar, how can you possibly do this when Islam has entered your own household? He said, what? My household? He said, yeah, your, your sister and your brother-in-law, they've become Muslim as well. And he, so he forgot about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and turned his direction straight to his sister's house. He knocked on the door, and his sister and brother-in-law, uh, they were studying, they were learning Quran from Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu knocked on the, and they had locked, uh, there were no locks as such as we have them today. But whatever there was on the door, they had secured it uh, so that nobody could just barge in. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu demanded for the door to be open and hearing his voice as a khabab quickly hid. And as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as soon as the door was opened, he pushed the door back and his sister had opened the door. He pushed her back as well and sat her on her, punched her and kicked her until she started to bleed. Then he turned his attention to his brother-in-law, Sa'id bin Zaid. He's also from the Ashra Mubashara and punched and kicked him and beat him as well. And when... He saw what he'd done, his sister was bleeding, his brother-in-law was bleeding. He felt a bit ashamed of how, what he had done. And in, in any case, his anger was now, you know, as, it, as they say, the steam was let out. So he was feeling embarrassed and ashamed of himself when he looked around and he saw as Khabbab had left a few pages of the Quran leaves or what leather, whatever it, the Quran was written upon. And uh, he tried to approach it and his sister Fatima, she intervened. And she said, oh, Omar, you are unclean. Uh, you can't touch this holy scripture. And so he, had, he, he cleaned himself, had a bath, and then he read what was on it. And it was, it was part of Surah Taha. And as soon as he started to read, because Umar ta'ala was one of the few who could read and write and had learned to read even before the advent of Islam. And uh, when he started reading and when he reached the verse, Innani an Allah... But Allah says, I am Allah. La ilaha illa ana fa'budni. There is no other God but me. So worship me. When Umar ta'ala reached this verse, uh, then he was a totally changed man. He said, take me to Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so they took him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala a few days had accepted Islam three days before. 
and he was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Islam of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anha was also strange. Uh, one day Abu Jahl, he had insulted the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, with, no, with no limits. And Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anha had gone out hunting. And when he returned, somebody reported to him, Oh, oh Hamza, what good is a man like you if people openly insult Muhammad, your nephew, in the manner that they did? Hazrat Hamza said, what happened? So he was told what had happened. So he went straight to Haram where Abu Jahl was sitting and he pointed to Abu Jahl. He says, never ever you dare insult my nephew again because I have also become a Muslim. I have accepted his faith. And he struck him with his bow in such a manner it left a mark on his skull and gave him a wound and his blood started spurting out. And then he came home and at nightfall he came to the Kaaba and he prayed to Allah, Ya Allah, that was on spur of the moment that I said I had accepted Islam and joined and accepted the deen of my nephew Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But Ya Allah, you know I haven't. And if, if what he says is right, then open my heart for him. And if what he is saying is not right and he is a liar, then make a way out for me. And by the morning, uh, Allah had opened his heart and he came to the Prophet wasallam and he accepted Islam sincerely. This, is the, this, is, this was natural, this is the right way to go about. Abu Jahl on the other hand, because Hidayat was not written in his hand, when the battle of Badr took place and he was leaving to go to, to Badr, he came to the Kaaba and made tawaf and he also made a dua and Allah has quoted that dua in the Quran with Qalullahumma in Kana Hada Hu al Hakka mina indika fa amtir alayna hijaratam minasama ya witina bi ada bin alim. Oh Allah, if this affair, in other words, Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if this is haq from you, then shower us with rocks. Uh, he didn't want to be Muslim, he didn't want to accept, even if it is right. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala on the other hand, he prayed, Ya Allah, if Islam is haq, then open my heart for it. And Allah opened his heart and he became a Muslim. And he was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Umar Radiallahu Ta'ala Anu was seen to be coming. And when he sought permission, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the, in, in the house of Arqam Radiallahu Ta'ala Anu at the time. And he sought permission to enter. And when the Muslims heard Hazrat Umar's voice, you know, they were alarmed, they were, they were concerned. But Hazrat Hamza said, have no worry. If Umar comes with a good intention, then all the better. But if he doesn't, then my sword is also here. And when he came, he was a changed man, and he he he, he declared his shahada in the Prophet in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's presence. And as soon as he said his shahada, Jibril came as well. Ya Rasulullah, are you happy at the Islam of Umar? The Prophet said, Yes, I am very happy. Uh, Jibril said, Ya Rasulullah, all the angels are happy as well. Uh, and and and. Uh, and Jalaluddin Suyuti Rahmahullah has written uh, that the angel, that Jibreel alayhi salam conveyed the congratulation of the angels to the Prophet. Can just say, Ya Rasulullah, Sare Frishte Mubarak Baad De Rahe Hai Ki Umur Musulman Ho Gaya. You know, when something good happens and we congratulate each other, you've done well, MashaAllah. The angels, uh, they wanted to offer their congratulations to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the acceptance of his dua and the Islam of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And as soon as Umar radiallahu ta'ala became a Muslim, he said, Ya Rasulullah, now we must pray openly. And they went to Haram and they formed two safs. As Hamza was in one saf and as Umar was in the other saf. And so with as Hamza and as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, are both in there along with them, then that, that, that opposition that the Quraysh had previously, that all went away. And Muslims were now able to preach openly and as well as that, and to pray openly. And as Umar radiallahu ta'ala <laughs> was the 40th person to become a Muslim. And then eventually when people started to make hijrah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and other sahaba made hijrah as well. And most people made hijrah secretly. But when Umar radiallahu ta'ala wanted to make hijrah, he came to the Kaaba and made a tawaf calmly. And then addressed the kuffar. He says, I'm leaving to go to, to Medina. And if anybody wants his mother to cry over him, his wife to be a widow, his children to be orphan, come and meet me outside. Because they didn't, they, 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 they didn't used to fight in Makkah. Makkah is Baladun Amin. Dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Wa'id qala Ibrahim, Rabbi jal hadha al-balada amina. Ya Allah, make this town a town of peace. Allah says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ amina." 
whosoever enters Makkah, enters Makkah, finds peace. Uh, even the Quraysh, in spite of all their jahiliya and everything, even if they found the killer of their father in the plain Makkah, they wouldn't kill him. They would take him outside to kill him. Outside the boundary of Haram and then kill him there. So, and, and it is mentioned in the Bible as well about, about God's chosen land, land of God's everlasting favor and glory. Uh, uh, obviously the Christians and the Jews are signing to be Jerusalem. But Jerusalem has never been a land of peace. Uh, Jerusalem has always been a land of trouble, bloodshed, killing. And to this day, hardly a day goes by when there is no, no, no trouble of one kind or the other in Jerusalem. In the book of Isaiah chapter 60, it says uh, that this land will be a land of peace where violence will never be heard. Its gates will never be shut by the day, no by the night. And we find, and it describes a long list of what's what to happen in God's chosen land of God's everlasting glory and mercy. And all this is not even a fraction is applicable to Jerusalem. Uh, but the main thing which I'm mentioning here, a land of peace will violence will never be heard. In Jerusalem, right from its inception, from the time it was established uh, in the olden days, Alexander the Great, while passing through, he attacked Jerusalem. Thousands of people were killed. Then before the advent of, uh, before the coming of Isa alayhi salam or Jesus, Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian king, story is mentioned in the Bible as well. He attacked Jerusalem, killed thousands of people, took many back as captives, as slaves back to Babylon, where the Jews stayed in, a, in captivity for many years until Daniel alayhi salam came and he was able to lead them back to Jerusalem. And then the Romans attacked it. And the time of Isa alayhi salatu was salam, uh, Jerusalem was under the rule of the Romans. Then many years, centuries later, the Persians captured it, captured it from the Jerusalems. Then the Romans took it back from Jerusalem, uh, from the Persians. And then the Muslims captured Jerusalem from the Romans. And it remained with the Muslims until the Crusaders came. And, and then the Crusaders captured Jerusalem from the Muslims. And then Salahuddin Ayyubi recaptured it from the Crusaders and it remained with the Muslims until, until the 1960s. And in each event, each time there was killing, there was bloodshed, thousands of people lost their lives on each of these stages. Whereas Makkah, uh, Makkah was never attacked by foreigners. There was some problem, uh, but we are not saying uh, that because the Bible says there will be no violence, innocence is not applicable. This is a verse of the Bible. But it is nowhere uh, nearly applicable upon Jerusalem because Jerusalem has never been a land of peace. It's been a land of immense bloodshed. Whereas Makkah has never been attacked by any foreigner. By any foreigner. So a land of peace. So Umar ta'ala said, I'm going. If anybody wants to stop me, come outside. But who would dare? Uh, so Abdullah ibn Masood ta'ala was saying, he said, As Umar ta'ala knows Islam uh, was Islam's victory. It, he broke the backbone of the kuffar and his hijrat, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was nusrat of Islam and his khilafat eventually uh, was mercy for the Muslims. And when Umar came and settled in Medina, obviously was with the Prophet wasallam in all the expeditions throughout from Badr till Tabuk. For he was in Badr, he was in Uhud, in Khandaq, in Hudaybiya and fath Makkah. And Tabuk and all the expeditions, wherever the Prophet ﷺ went, he was with the Prophet ﷺ. He was about 15 years younger than the Prophet ﷺ, or about 13, 13 years. And just as Abu Bakr ﷺ, he offered his daughter Aisha anha to be married to the Prophet ﷺ, so did Umar Allah blessed him, and his daughter Hafsa anha, she also came into the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ. As Aisha came first, and then Hafsa anha. She was initially married to another Sahabi who died after the Battle of Badr, and when she became a widow, and being the daughter of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and being, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was one of those people whom the Prophet ﷺ loved very dearly. It is stated by Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu Bukhari. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once and he said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu nasi ahabbu ilayk. Who is the person from amongst all the people that you love the most? And the Prophet said, Aisha. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, min rijal from the men. The Prophet said, Abuha, her father. And he said, Thumma man. And then the Prophet said, Umar. 
As Amr bin Nasr radiallahu ta'ala then asked him about various different people and then he stopped because he didn't want to be on the bottom of the list. Uh, but the, the people loved by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam most as Aisha, then her father and then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And there is uh, from the, the, the sons of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, obviously as Ali radiallahu ta'ala had two famous sons, Hassan and Hussein. They were from Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And about whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, al Hassan wal Husaynu Sayyida Shabaab Ahl al Jannah. Hassan and Hussein are the leaders of the youth of paradise. And they were Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu's sons from Hazrat Fatima. But Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu afterwards also married many other, some other women as well. And one of them uh, was his, uh, his uh, one of his wives was, uh, was a woman given to him uh, by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Her name was Khawla and her kunia wa ummi Ayman. And from her, he had a son, his name was Muhammad. He's known as Muhammad bin Hanafiya. And the Shias also regard him as a very special man. A son of Hazrat Ali, but not from Hazrat Fatima, from one of his other wives, Muhammad bin Hanafiya. And Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, has brought a narration in Sahih Bukhari, when Muhammad bin Hanafiya, and as Ali radiallahu ta'ala used to love him dearly as well. In fact, before Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala passed away, he gave us at Hassan and Hussein special instructions to look after him. He says, look after your brother Muhammad because you know that I love him as well. So Muhammad bin Hanafiya, he asked as Ali radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Sa'alto abi, I asked my father Ali radiallahu ta'ala, ayyu nasi khayrun ba'da nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who was the man who was best after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Who's asking who? Muhammad bin Hanafiya, the son of Hazrat Ali, he's asking his father, who? Ali. Muhammad, son of Hazrat Ali, is asking his father, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, no? Ayyu nasi khayrun ba'da nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, faqal Abu Bakr. Hazrat Ali was asked, who's the best man after the Prophet, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Hazrat Ali said, Abu Bakr. Then he said, qultu summa man. Then I said, who then? He said, Umar. And he said, وَخَشِيتُ أَنْ يَقُولَ Usman فَقُلْتُ ثُمَّ أَنْتَ And then he said, after Hazrat Ali said, Umar, he said, I was afraid that if I ask him who next, my father will say Usman. So I didn't want him to say Usman. So I said, then you? He said, no. مَا أَنَا إِلَّا رَجُلٌ مِّنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He goes, I was just an ordinary Muslim. Uh, that was Ali radiallahu anhu's tawadu, but we obviously regard as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be similarly special. But even in the eyes of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, after Abu Bakr, the best man, as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And after Abu Bakr, the man loved by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most, was at Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Again, again in Mishkat, there, 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 there is a narration. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala has mentioned that when Umar radiallahu ta'ala was martyred and his janaza was prepared and then he was standing on the janaza of Umar radiallahu ta'ala when a man from behind him put his hand on the shoulders of Abdullah bin Abbas and he said, I knew and I hope that Allah inni l'arju an yaj'akal an yaj'alakallahu ma'a sahibayik I hope that Allah will unite you with your two friends, Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because many, many times I have heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Me and Abu Bakr and Umar. I did this and Abu Bakr and Umar. I went somewhere, Abu Bakr and Umar. We did this, Abu, me, Abu Bakr and Umar. And I knew that you will be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. And Abdullah bin Abbas says, when I turned around, ثم التفتو, فَإِنَّهُ Ali bin Abi Talib. When I looked around, it was none other than Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And as Ali knew that Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he is in the same, he is in the same group. Uh, he is to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala being so close to the Prophet and when his daughter became a widow, the Prophet was naturally concerned. And except Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, all the women that the Prophet married were widows or divorcees. Uh, widows mostly. And the seeing that obviously the concern of Hazrat Umar being worried that his daughter had become a widow, the Prophet sallallahu wanted to comfort him. And what better comfort would it have been than for the Prophet to marry her as well? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala was worried about finding another husband for the Hafsa. And he came to Abu Bakr and he offered his daughter to Abu Bakr. 
رضي الله تعالى عنه and he said Abu Bakr if you want you know my daughter is here and if you want you know you can marry her and Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه didn't say anything and then as Umar was amazed how can Abu Bakr not say anything Abu Bakr say something at least <laughs> whether you accept her or don't or whatever Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه didn't say anything then he approached Usman رضي الله عنه and he said Usman you know if you want you know you know my daughter has become a widow I'm looking for someone to marry her and if you want you know I'm willing to offer you my daughter for marriage and as Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala was still young barely in, in her early 20s and she was uh, only a few years older than as a Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and uh, she was she was young barely in her 20s and uh, not a very old woman either and uh, as Usman radiallahu ta'ala he said you know Umar you know what I at the moment I don't have any plans to get married as, as Usman radiallahu ta'ala had married had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's daughter Ummi Kulthum. He had initially married as a Ruqayya in the battle of Badr. When the Muslims went to Badr in their absence, as the Ruqayya had passed away. And upon the Prophet's return, the Prophet gave his other daughter Ummi Kulthum to Usman. In time, she also passed away as well. But at the time that Usman was married to Ummi Kulthum. And uh, so he, he, he expressed his apology. And uh, because a few days earlier, as Umar wasn't in the company of the Prophet when the Prophet وسلم, had expressed a wish and a desire and, uh, and the thought that he was going to propose to Hazrat Umar for Hazrat Hafsa. And so happened a few days later or sometime later, the Prophet وسلم, himself offered to marry Hazrat Hafsa. And when after the marriage, Abu Bakr met Hazrat Umar. He said, oh Umar, you know what, you were probably angry with me that day, you offered your daughter to me. But I knew that the Prophet had wanted to propose for your daughter. So for me to accept her would have been wrong. How can I accept something which Prophet wants? And for me to reject her it would have been like rejecting something the Prophet likes as well. So I had no option but to remain silent. Uh, look at the wisdom of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. No. He didn't want to uh, you know, put himself above the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, you know, and oh, but also, uh, he didn't want to even appear to dislike something. You know, someone the Prophet disliked as well. And as Usman radiallahu ta'ala later also clarified the issue uh, that because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had had said that he was going to propose for her, then it was unsuitable for me to accept or reject the proposal as well. So as Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma are known as shaykhain. Uh, people who gave their daughters to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in common in common terminology in society, they are, that's known as father-in-law. The relationship between the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as the Abu Bakr and Umar was such uh, that they were like the father-in-laws of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They gave their daughters to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, as it Usman and as it Ali, uh, they were special in their own way as well. That they the, that the Prophet gave them his daughters. Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma gave their daughters to the Prophet and at Usman and Ali, the Prophet gave them his daughters. And you can imagine obviously the hand which gives is superior than the hand that which takes. Uh, it was Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma's kismet or their sa'ada or their sharaf Allah had written and them to be have such a relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although from the nasr, from the ancestors, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, was also from the part of the family of the Prophet. He'd given his daughter to the Prophet sallallahu as well. But later on, uh, there was a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu which Shiat scholars have also brought in some of their classical books. Uh, it was the Prophet sallallahu once said that all relationships and ansab, and uh, means ancestral links, uh, will have no value whatsoever except my relationship. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he wanted to be close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the, from the Prophet's family, the Quraysh. He'd also offered his daughter to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he wanted an opportunity to be closer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So at a later instance, uh, when Allah blessed us a Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha with her own sons and, some, and daughters as well. Hazrat Fatima had three sons, Hassan, Hussein and Muhsin. Hassan and Hussain are famous. Mohsin died at a tender age as well. And then two of her daughters, Zainab and Umm Kulthum. 
Umm Kulthum was a common name amongst the Sahaba as well. The Prophet had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulthum. Hazrat Fatima had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulthum. Hazrat Abu Bakr had another daughter from another marriage. Her name was also Umm Kulthum. And so the daughter of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha in the 17th year after Hijrah. It is mentioned that she was born around the 6th year after Hijrah. After Hassan and Hussein. After Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there was another daughter, Z Z Zainab, and Umm Kulsum was, was slightly younger than her. So she was born around the sixth year after Hijri. And so in the 17th year after Hijra, in which, uh, the year in which there was a famine, a drought in Medina, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu took the people out to pray for Salatul Istisqa. And it was on this occasion he made a special dua, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Allahumma inna kunna natawassalu ilayka bi nabiyyik Ya Allah, we used to make tawassul, wasila of your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam But now we make wasila of the uncle of your Prophet So give us rain uh, So this dua is mentioned from here Some people say that the wasila of dead people is not permissible But other uh, ulama also deduce That Umar radiallahu ta'ala was just trying to show people That you can also make wasila of people Other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well so some people say you can't make wasila of dead people, not even the Prophet ﷺ. But from the same hadith, other ulama also deduce because this happened in the 17th year after Hijra. And as Umar says, Inna kunna natawassalu ilayka bi nabiyyik. Ya Allah, we used to make wasila of your Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet passed away in the 11th year after Hijra. So it shows for at least for six years, Sahaba continued to make wasila of the Prophet ﷺ in spite of the Prophet having passed away. And wasila, it is based on, 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 on the assumption uh, that Allah loves, not just the assumption, but belief rather, uh, that Allah loves His beloved Prophet ﷺ. And because Allah loves His beloved Prophet ﷺ, so if we present the wasila of the Prophet ﷺ to Allah, Allah will not reject our dua. And if we see if that was true, which it was while the Prophet was alive, did Allah not love his beloved Prophet after his death? Allah, obviously Allah continued love and to this day Allah still loves and will carry on loving the Prophet ﷺ. And the wasila that Hazrat Umar ta'ala gave of the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, it wasn't just based on piety. Otherwise Umar himself ta'ala was much more pious and more special than Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So it shows in their eyes the wasila of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even in spite of his death, uh, was still practiced by Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majma'een. And any, anyway, I was saying that happened in the 17th year. And this is the same year that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu proposed to Hazrat Ali. As Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhu had passed away long ago. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, he passed away in the 11th year as a Fatima only remained alive for six months after the Prophet ﷺ. While the Prophet was in his final illness, he called as a Fatima once. As a Fatima, when she came to visit the Prophet ﷺ, he called Fatima close to him and he whispered something in her ear and she began to cry. And then seeing her cry, then he whispered something again in her ears uh, which made her smile. And after the Prophet passed away, some of the wives of the Prophet asked her, O oh, Fatima, what had happened? And she said, well, the first instant the Prophet said to me, O oh, Fatima, I think in, my, in this illness I will leave this world. So I was sad and I began to cry. And then the Prophet said, O oh, Fatima, don't worry. From my family you will be the first one to join me. And so I felt better that I won't have to wait too long before I join the beloved Prophet of Allah. And so only after six months after the Prophet's demise, has a Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha also passed away. So uh, many years had passed and when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha, seeing Umm Kulthum radiallahu ta'ala anha was now of the age where she could be married, he proposed to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, and he asked so that if he can be married to her and in this way, strengthen his bond and relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Ali initially said that I had wanted her and I kept her for his nephew, Abdullah bin Jafar. Jafar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was at Ali's elder brother who was martyred in the battle of Muta. And his wife, Asma bint Amis, uh, she married Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Some, you know, the Shias, they say uh, Abu Bakr and Umar, they were enemies of Ahl-Bayt. 
if that had been the case, and that, you know, look at the relationships that they had between themselves. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu's elder brother's widow, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu married her, and after Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away, Asma bint Amis then married Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And, and anyway, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to Hazrat Umar that I had, I had wanted to give her to Abdullah bin Jafar. Uh, the son of Jafar, his nephew. But as Umar insisted, Oh Ali, you know, I think you know, I am more worthy of, of, uh, of this, of this rishta or of this marriage. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would consider it an immense favor of you upon me if you allow me. Uh, this will give me a stronger bond with the Prophet wasallam. And as Ali then agreed. And as Umar was extremely happy and proud that it made a way for that Umar anhu to be related in a closer manner to the Prophet Look at the relationship they had. Hazrat Umar gave his daughter to the Prophet The Prophet gave his daughter to Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Ali in turn gave his daughter to Hazrat Umar. You know, completing the circle and the cycle. Hazrat Umar gave his daughter to the Prophet as Hafsa. The Prophet gave his daughter Fatima to Hazrat Ali. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu then gave his daughter Umm Kulthum to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So, Allahu Akbar. And, and many, many classical scholars, including Yaqub Kulaini and others, the old classical Shiite scholars have acknowledged the fact that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was married to Hazrat Ali and as a Fatima's daughter Umm Kulthum. Although, like I explained, there were other Umm Kulthums, but the Umm Kulthum that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu married wasn't any other Umm Kulthum, but the Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Hazrat Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is very significant in this, in, with, with regards to the fact that if Hazrat Ali did not consider Hazrat Umar to be a true believer, would he have given him his daughter? When the Quran forbids Muslims, وَلَا تَنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنَّ وَلَأَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ عَجَبَتْكُمْ وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا uh, no, no Muslim should marry a mushrik woman and no Muslim man should marry a mushrik woman. And no Muslim... No Muslim woman, uh, man should marry a mushrik woman and no Muslim woman should marry a mushrik man. So if Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu considered Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to na'uzu billah, na'uzu billah, to be a munafiq or a kafir, could he have given his own daughter to a mushrik or a munafiq or a kafir? So it shows that Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu considered Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be a worthy Muslim and not just a worthy Muslim, a true believer. Allah says, Hatta yu'minu until they become true believers. Uh, so it shows Hazrat Ali considered Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, uh, to be a true believer, otherwise he would not have given him his daughter. And it so happened, it was destined to be the case. Allah knew there will come a time when people claiming their love for the Ahli Bayt will be critical and criticize and curse and abuse and insult uh, those, those noble companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Allah so destined to shut them up 1400 years earlier so that nobody will be able to lift a finger at them that they are. Look at them, look at their affairs with the Ahli Bayt. Look at their friendship, relationship with the Ahli Bayt. If they were not true believers, then the Ahli Bayt would not, have, would not have dealt with them in that manner. And in Shia books it's written, Imam Jafir Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was one of the great grandsons of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Shias regard him as one of their Imams. And he was asked about the iddat of a woman whose husband dies. What should happen to her? And Imam Jafir Sadiq, you know, just as we have Fiqh Hanfi, Fiqh Shafi, Fiqh Malki, Fiqh Hanbali, the Shias, their Fiqh is known as Fiqh Jafariya. And that is based fundamentally on the teachings of Imam Jafir Sadiq, according to them. But Imam Jafir Sadiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was one of the scholars of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and not the Imam that Shias assign him to be. He was asked about where a woman 
who becomes a widow should spend her iddat. And Imam Jafir Sadiq said, when Umm Kulthum radiallahu ta'ala became a widow at the death of Hazrat Umar, then Hazrat Ali came to her house and took her home to spend her iddat there. So even Imam Jafir Sadiq accepted and acknowledged and approved that Hazrat Umm Kulthum radiallahu ta'ala anha was married to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha. And in any case, after, after uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu became Khalifa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not appointed him in plain, clear terms to be Khalifa, you know, that, that he should be Khalifa openly. Although on many occasions the Prophet gave hints that after me it should be Abu Bakr to become your leader. Like appointing him Amir of Hajj. Uh, like appointing him Imam in his own presence. And there were other verses in the Quran had been revealed to express Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and his nobility over other Sahaba. Thani yathnaini idhuma fil ghar and other verses in the Quran. And, and when, um, when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was about to pass away and he realized he hasn't got long to live, he asked the people whom they would like as their Amir. And different people gave their different opinions. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala eventually decided that he wanted to appoint Umar radiallahu ta'ala to be his successor. He did, did not want any dispute amongst the people. So he appointed Umar radiallahu ta'ala to be the successor, his successor and to be Amir of the Muslims. Some people came and objected, well Umar is very strict, very strict. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala he said, I oh, know the burden of Khilafat will soften him, don't worry. Uh, now he doesn't have that responsibility over his head. But when he is given responsibility and acquires the burden of Khilafat, uh, then Umar will become a soft man. And he is, the, if Allah asks me, he says, on the day of Qiyamah, if Allah asks me, who did you leave Ummah in whose hands? I will say, I left the Ummah in the hands of the best person on the surface of the earth. And in my eyes, there was no one better than Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu, uh, to lead the people. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, when, the, uh, when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anu was, was to be appointed as Amir and Khalifa, uh, and initially Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anu presented, offered or proposed that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu should be Khalifa. And he said, I've heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that the sun has not risen on a man better than Umar. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu said, no, no, Umar, oh, no, Abu Bakr, how can anyone take, take, uh, 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 take lead over you when you are present, when, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed you as the, as the Imam in Salah when he was still alive. And on other, on other occasions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, In the nations, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَبْلَ فِي مَا قَبْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأُمَّمِ مُحَدَّثُونَ In the previous nations, there were people and that Allah used to talk, Allah used to talk to, مِنْ غَيْرِ أَنْ يَكُونُ أَنْبِيَا They want prophets, but Allah used to talk to them. In other words, Allah used to inspire them uh, with what pleases Allah. And in Tariq al-Khulafa, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti rahmahullah has written and that there were 20 places and that Allah liked what Umar radiallahu ta'ala had said so much that Allah revealed them as Quran. In other words, Allah had inspired Umar. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala used to say things which used to please Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, Inna Allah ja'ala al-haqq ala lisaani Umar wa qalbi. Allah has put haqq, the truth, on the tongue and heart of Umar. In another, says, in an, in another hadith it is stated, it is stated Inna al-haqq yantaliq wa la lisaani Umar. Haqq speaks the tongue of Umar. In another narration it is said, Inna Allah wada al-haqq ala lisaani Umar. Allah has placed haqq on the tongue of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was aware of how special Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is. And so he appointed him to be the Amir after him. And in his Khilafat, as soon as Abu Bakr, in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there was not much expansion of Islam for different reasons. And the reason was, one of the reasons that Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala remained Khalifa for only two and a quarter years, two years and a few months. And, and one of the th uh, reasons why uh, he lived so lush, so sure, Allah destined him to be that way, uh, but he missed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much uh, that on daily basis, uh, deep inside, that the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't there, 
and he would miss the Prophet ﷺ so much that was eating him away inside and he could not take it anymore. And very soon after that, only just, just two years, Hazrat Abu Bakr left this world as well. And the fact that as soon as the Prophet ﷺ left this world, uh, many people became murtad. Other people laid claims to nubuvat. Many people refused to give zakat and so on. The Romans wanted to attack Medina. And Abu Bakr had to deal very, very strong-handedly uh, with these fitnas. And Allah restored Islam to its previous glory. Uh, but at the same time, when as Abu Bakr left this world, and as soon as Umar became Khalifa, it paved the way for the expansion of Islam. And the Prophet Wasallam's prophecies, uh, which he had prophesied to the supremacy of Islam and spread of Islam, conquest of the Persians, Romans and the Yemenis, they all came true uh, during the Khilafat of Umar. The Persians were defeated. It's a famous incident, Hadith of the Prophet, uh, when they were uh, digging the trench, in the battle of Khandaq and they came a rock which Sahaba could not break and the Prophet ﷺ was informed and he came and he struck a blow with an axe on the rock and the spark came out and the Prophet said uh, um, um, be aware uh, ha have the good news and that that the Persians will be conquered and then he struck a, uh, and a bit of the rock fell away and then he struck the rock with a second blow and there was another spark and the Prophet said um, be aware that the Romans will also be, will be, will be conquered. Sahaba chanted takbir. And then the Prophet wasallam he said, he struck a final blow, a third blow, which cracked the rock totally. And there was another spark. And the Prophet said, the Yemenis will also be captured and conquered. Sahaba raised takbir. And this came true during the Khilafat of Umar. And the Prophet had prayed, Allah, Ya Allah, Help Islam, give Islam honor and glory through Umar. And it was through Umar that all these territories, all these superpowers of the time, uh, they were defeated and they were humiliated and Islam reigned supreme. And Shia scholars themselves in their tafsirs have acknowledged the fact uh, that this, that this, this ayat in the Quran, وَالَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُذْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ Allah has sent His beloved messenger with hidayat and the haq deen for it to prevail over all other adiyan and this is linked with the prophecy of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during khandaq in which the prophet prophesied the capture of the romans persians and yemenis and that came true in the khilafat of umar radiyallahu ta'ala so the prophet's dua and with regards to that umar ya allah help islam through either umar bin hisham or umar ibn khattab uh, it came to its full fruit and full glory in the shape of Umar radiallahu ta'ala during his Khilafat. And then eventually, uh, when, when Umar radiallahu ta'ala in his Khilafat, uh, the Persians, Egypt, uh, many part, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Sham, all these territories came into Islam uh, to the extent 2.2 million miles, square miles, 2.2 million square miles uh, came into the Islamic Khilafah. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala was seeing the spread of Islam so far. And he was returning from Hajj. In the 23rd year after Hijrah. 12 years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the, in the month of Zil Hajj on the way back. Or rather uh, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti has, has written in Mina. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala was still there. He got off his camel and he looked up to the heavens. And he said, Ya Allah, I've become old. My limbs are giving away. And Ya Allah, before... Before anything happened that I lose my senses and I am unable to control the situation. Ya Allah, take me away. Take me away. Allah had blessed Umar radiallahu ta'ala especially uh, with this fahm. He says in hadith, Ittaqu min firasatil mu'min fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. Uh, be afraid of the insight of a believer because he sees with the nur of Allah. And Allah had given Umar radiallahu ta'ala such a firasat. He could see a man and judge him. Uh, for what he is suited the most. Uh, this man, he could look at him and see, you know, what can this man do best? And look by this firasat, Umar radiallahu ta'ala was able to appoint many governors, many governors on, 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 on suitable provinces, and because of which he was able to control the affairs of the ummah in, with such efficiency in the manner that he was. And after his final hajj, when he was coming back, he made this dua. And when he came back to Medina, 
a few days afterwards, Saad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala who had been the governor of Kufa and there was a, uh, he, he had a Persian slave, Abu Lu'lu, who was an expert carpenter and he sent him to Medina uh, to, to be able to help Muslims uh, and do their work and to so be a useful member of, 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 of Medina to do some work etc. for the Muslims. And he had made a deal with Saad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala that if he allowed him to go out and work then uh, then uh, he, he, he then he could also keep some of his earnings as well as giving Saad radiallahu ta'ala a, a fair portion of his earnings. That way he could make money for himself as well and, uh, and so on. So he came to us, Umar radiallahu ta'ala and complained that Saad's demand were unjust. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala assessed his potential and he, and he rejected his claim. He said, no, you can, you, can, you can earn more and make good money for yourself as well because you're such a skilled person. Abu Lu'lu, he wasn't happy at uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu's decision and he then decided that he was going to teach his Umar a lesson and he decided within him that he was going to assassinate Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu. Hazrat Umar in the meantime saw a dream that he was bitten by a, by a, uh, by a, uh, a rooster a kumurag ni thong mari and which caused him to bleed so the Umar ta'ala realized uh, that his death was very near and he had made a dua and throughout he would make dua Ya Allah, Allahu marzuqni shahadatin fi sabilik wajal mawti fi baladi rasulik Ya Allah, give me shahadat in your path but make my death in Medina. People used to say, Umar, what sort of dua is that? If you want to die as a shaheed then you have to go out in the path of Allah and fight in a battlefield and now all over Hijaz, Islam's borders have spread far and wide. How can you possibly attain shahadat in Medina. But he used to say, I am, I am hopeful in the mercy of Allah. Allah will give me shahadat and Allah will give it to me in Medina. Once he was giving a khutbah, uh, and Maulana Yusuf Kandri rahimahullah has written a book called Hayatul Sahaba and in that book he's brought this hadith as well. And he was giving a khutbah and he said, Inna fi jannati adnin qasran lahu khamsu mi'atu bab. Lahu khamsu mi'a bab ala kulli babin khamsatu alafin min al-hur in in Jannah, there is such a special palace which has 500 rooms. And in each room, there are 5,000 whores, wives, uh, waiting for a person. And then he was sitting on the member or standing on the member, and he said, لا يدخله إلا النبي. Such a palace is only reserved for prophets. Then he looked at the grave of Rasulullah wasallam, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, how fortunate you are to be in such palaces. And then he carried on and saying, Oh, Sadiq. And the other person to enter such a palace will be a, will be a Siddiq. He looked at the grave of Abu Bakr and he said, Oh, Abu Bakr, and you are also so fortunate to be in such palaces. Then he said, Oh, oh Shaheed. And the third person to enter in such palaces will be a Shaheed. Then he addressed himself, Oh, Omar. Anna laka shahadata ya Omar. Oh, Omar. You know, how are you going to attain Shahada? But he was hopeful he would make dua, Ya Allah. Uh, give me, and from this 500 rooms with 5,000 hoor, so you, when you multiply 500 by 5,000, you know what it comes to? Two and a half million. And this is why the Tablighis, they say, you know, in Jannah there's a special palace, a special Jannah with the two and a half million hoors. Uh, one is sufficient, but subhanAllah, two and a half million. Uh, the only authority of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then how Allah blessed him with shahadat. Oh, he, was, he was coming forward to, to lead people in Fajr Salat. When Abu Lu'lu feroz, uh, with a dagger dipped in poison, then he came and he stabbed Umar radiallahu ta'ala repeatedly. And Allahu Akbar, which caused such severe bleeding and eventually led to the shahadat of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And when he realized he's, he's not going to survive, he sent his son Abdullah to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was buried in her hujra. Then later on Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was also buried there. He had a wish to be buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala sent his son Abdullah and he asked the Aisha for special permission to be allowed to be buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, I had reserved this place for myself but I gave Umar preference over myself. But it wasn't just her wish and his wish. Allah had destined uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu to be buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because 
as the Prophet had said, Ana wa Abu Bakr wa Umar, khulqna min turbatin wahida, fiha nudfan, we have been created from the same turba, from the same mixture, from the same dust, and this is where we will be buried. And so he's buried with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, and on many occasions the Prophet said, hakada nub'athu yawm al qiyamah, this is how we will rise. On the day of Qiyamah, the Prophet said, Ana awwalu man tanshaqqul anhu al ard, I am the first person upon whom the earth will open and I will rise thumma Abu Bakr thumma Umar then Abu Bakr and then Umar thumma aati ila al baqi then the prophet said then I will come to baqi and in baqi who's buried there Usman the prophet's family is buried there uh, the prophet's daughters and and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wives most of his wives and as it Usman radiallahu ta'ala is also buried there so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will gather them and then the people of mecca will rise and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will proceed uh, towards hashr and then on the pond as well uh, when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be on the pond of kawthar inna atina kal kawthar he will have abu bakr radiallahu ta'ala on one side and as it umar radiallahu ta'ala on his other side so abu bakr and in, other, and in other hadith, the Prophet said, uh, every, every Prophet has two advisors, assistants. And he said, my two advisors, my advisors and helpers in the heavens are Jibreel and Mikail, and my helpers and advisors on earth are Abu Bakr and Umar. My advisors on, on this earth are Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, they are resting presently with the Prophet wasallam in that special place. As the Prophet said, Ma bayna bayti wa minbari min riyadil jannah. That piece of land between my minbar and my house is a garden from the gardens of paradise. So Abu Bakr and Umar are already in jannah. So it doesn't matter what the Shias they say. It doesn't matter how much it burns them and how much it hates, it causes them so much, whatever, uh, they can burn. In fact, because of in their hearts, they have that hatred for Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Allah has decided to punish them even in this world. Come every Muharram, they claim their love for Hussein radiallahu ta'ala. But the reality is, subhanallah, how can Allah possibly allow any chest which has love for the family of the Prophet to be beaten? But it shows they mainly, they claim love, but deep down in their hearts, they harbor nifaq, hypocrisy, hatred for the beloved friends of Rasulullah, and in reality his family as well. So Allah makes such people beat themselves. And if you go on the internet and you see Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, such shocking behavior, not just grown-ups, little children cutting themselves with knives, and in fact, on one, one Australian man happened to witness this and he was so shocked. Uh, can anybody, how, how can any man in their right senses beat themselves? But Allah, Allah has punished them. The azab they will receive in the akhirat uh, awaits them. But in dunya, in dunya, Allah is making them punish themselves with knives and chains and all sorts of things. And if you go on the YouTube and you see some of the displays they give, uh, Allahu Akbar, how the blood flows uh, from their chests, from their heads, from their backs, covered in blood, uh, with their own hands. How can anyone love Allah and His Rasul and the family of the Prophet ﷺ and then yet beat themselves? The reality is, those hearts and those chests don't have any love for Rasulullah or his family, but because they have hatred for Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Hazrat Usman and the rest of Sahaba, so that is a punishment from Allah for them in this world. What awaits them in the hereafter is much more. And those who love Abu Bakr, those who love Umar, those who love Usman radiallahu ta'ala and Hazrat Ali and the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are the real Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah and they can hope to be with the Prophet and his companions and his Sahaba and we hope and pray to Allah. May Allah raise us among such blessed people.